Now we are studying on Sunday evenings the letter of James, and we have already found that it is a lesson in practical Christianity. James's great emphasis is upon the evidences in the lives of God's people of true saving faith. And the evidence of saving faith he finds in our daily Christian behavior and lifestyle. And there is no place where that very principle is more necessary to be applied than in the relation of the believer to the Word of God. And that is the subject that James is dealing with in the verses that we read together earlier in our service. The link between this passage and the previous one, you will notice, is in the phrase in verse 18, the word of truth. In verse 18, James is telling us that the instrument that God uses to bring us to the new birth in Christ is the word of truth. Peter emphasizes the same thing when he says, We are born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible by the word of God, which lives and abides forever. And if you were to ask James, what was the means God uses to produce this new nature in us and to bring us to the birth in Christ he would say the instrument is the Word of God. And many of us would be able to testify to the truth of that in our own lives. It is as we read the Word of God for ourselves, as we listen to it being explained to us perhaps by one other person, or as we sat listening to it being taught in some public place, it was then that we discovered the Spirit of God working that miraculous change in us which the Bible calls the new birth. And we found ourselves made, whether we discovered it suddenly or over a period of time, new creatures in Jesus Christ. But if you had to ask James the accompanying question, how does a newly born babe in Christ grow in grace? How does someone who has received new life begin to develop new character and new behavior? He would have said to you, the answer is precisely the same. The instrument of our spiritual birth is none other than the Word of God. And the instrument of our spiritual growth is none other than the Word of God. And here this evening he is going to speak to us about the same Word which he describes in verse 21 as the Word planted in you. In verse 22, as the word that we need to listen to and more, as the perfect law that gives freedom in verse 25. He speaks about the need to hear it in verse 19. Everyone should be quick to listen. And he is clearly speaking about listening to the word. He speaks about receiving or accepting it towards the end of verse 21. He speaks about doing it or obeying it in verse 23. And he speaks about gazing intently into it in verse 25. And so the theme is the relation of the believer to the Word of God. And there are five very simple things that James tells us need to be paramount in our relationship to the Word of God, if we are going to see it, enable us to grow in grace and exhibit a new life. The first of these, if I may tell you what they are so that you will have the general plan in your mind, even roughly, 
The first of these is we are to hear it eagerly in verses 19 and 20. Secondly, we are to prepare for it thoroughly in verse 21 at the beginning. And in the second half of verse 21, we are to receive it humbly and wholeheartedly. Fourthly, we are to obey it perseveringly, and that's the theme of verses 22 to 25. And finally, in verses 26 and 27, we are to exhibit it practically. So these are the things that James has to say to us about the relationship of the believer to the Word of God. And what I want to say to you as we begin to try to understand what James is teaching us is that there is nothing and can be nothing that is so important in the lives of Christian people like ourselves than this. I think that more hangs on this issue for our spiritual future than almost anything else. And for many of you sitting here in St. George's Tron this evening, what you are going to make of the Christian life, what you are going to become as Christian men and women in the future, largely ties in to what James is saying in these simple and to many of us fairly familiar truths. The great problem for most of us is, are they just familiar truths in our heads, or have they become the very essence of our Christian living? So first, he says, we are to hear the Word of God eagerly. Verse 19, my dear brothers, take note of this. Now notice how James is intent upon bringing us face to face with these truths. Everyone should be quick to listen or to hear. The idea is, of course, that the Christian who wants to grow in grace and in the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ will have a certain attitude to the Word of God. It is indeed one of the first fruits of the new birth. And you will, if you are a Christian man or woman this evening, you will recognize this in your own experience. One of the first things that happens when somebody is born anew is that their attitude to and relationship with the Word of God changes. I have lost count of the number of people who have come to me and said, I have discovered that I have a totally different approach to the Bible. For the first time in my life, it has become something that engrosses my interest. I find that God actually speaks to me from it. I discover that it's relevant to my daily life. And so they go on. It becomes something that's a characteristic of the new birth. Now, it's this that James is speaking about when he says everyone, that is, everyone who has been born anew through the word of truth should be quick to listen. And the eagerness with which the new believer will give himself to the hearing of God's Word is one of the great tests of the new birth. And we need to pause and ask ourselves, is that something that is present in my own life? Is that something that I have myself experienced? That I find myself eagerly waiting for God to speak to me out of His Word. Now, the opposite of that, do you notice in verse 19, is to be not quick to listen, but quick to speak instead of to hear. So, James says, 
Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak. Now you see how practical all of this is. The danger that he's identifying when he says be slow to speak is the danger of being more ready to express our own opinion than to listen to God's. And that's the tension that there is, you see. He says, be quick to listen, slow to speak, whereas the tendency of our own hearts and spirits is to be slow to hear and quick to speak, being more ready perhaps for discussion than instruction. Do you know the tendency? There is a very real problem in many people's lives when they are a little bit on in the Christian life that they become largely unteachable because they think that their ministry is that of teaching others. And James says, everyone should be quick to listen slow to speak. And whereas, of course, there is a tremendous value in humble mutual discussion, so often the spirit that James is speaking about wants debate and argument rather than the humble spirit he will speak about again in a moment of a readiness to be taught. Now, it's significant, I think, that in this very same context, he adds the phrase, and slow to become angry, because he recognizes that where you do not get this teachable spirit, this eagerness to hear the Word of God and to cry out with Samuel, Speak, Lord, for your servant hears, the opposite of it is a clamant insistence on being heard and almost entering into the kind of debate and argument which can produce anger. Now, you don't need me to elaborate on that. You will be well aware of the kind of thing that James is speaking about. But one of the signs of the new birth is an eager, humble desire to be taught and a readiness to listen rather than to speak and to be involved in being instructed rather than in giving our opinion as though it were almost equivalent to the authority of Scripture. Just let me add a footnote on that, because it seems to be rather important. This very spirit that James is speaking about, that quickly rushes to speak and quickly becomes short-tempered, is further elaborated in verse 21, in verse 20 rather, where he seems to bring together two things that we might not familiarly bring together. One is getting on with people, and the other is going on with God. Do you notice how James binds them in verse 20? Man's anger, he says, does not bring about the righteous life that God desires. So there are brought together the righteous life that God desires and man's anger. That is the spirit that divides people from each other. And I say to you again, getting on with people and going on with God are bound together here by James. 
And it's a very important thing for us to grasp this. I tell you, it's one of the marks of the grace of God beginning to plow deeply into people's lives that they will be the kind of people who will get on with other people. You know there are some who are always insistent on getting their own opinion out, having their own way, insisting on their own right to have their, their voice heard. And it creates division. And it makes them the kind of people who don't get on with others. Now, some people might want to detach that from everything else and say, that's just the kind of person I am. Always speak my mind, you know. And may get up people's backs. But getting on with people and going on with God appear to be bound together by James. Let me read it to you again. Man's anger does not bring about the righteous life that God desires. So there is the first thing. We are to hear the Word of God eagerly. That involves having a teachable spirit, learning to hear rather than to speak, and being concerned that God himself would instruct us in his word. It's very significant that when you come into the beginning of chapter 3, James is obviously aware of the danger that teachers or ministers or preachers have in this very connection. That since a great deal of their life is taken up with teaching and speaking to other people, they need to guard the whole world of how much they hear from God, how much they listen, how much they sit at the feet of Christ, to be taught. And so he says in chapter 3, Do not many of you presume to be teachers, my brothers, because you know that we who teach will be judged more strictly. In other words, there is a special responsibility that is laid upon those who speak rather than listen. So we are to hear the word eagerly. You notice the second thing in verse 21 is that we are to prepare for it thoroughly. Therefore, he says, get rid of all moral filth and the evil that is so prevalent and humbly accept the word planted in you which can save you. Now, many people have pointed out how often James is clearly dependent on the teaching of Jesus, and especially in the Sermon on the Mount. And that's very clear when you read through James's letter. But here especially, it's obvious that he is thinking of the teaching of Jesus in the parable of the sower. He speaks about the Word of God as being planted in you which is able to produce a harvest and save you, that is, bring about all the fruits of salvation in you. But it's very clear that in Jesus' parable, you will remember, one of the great obstacles that the seed of the Word which was planted in the soil encountered was that it didn't have the full right to the whole land. There were other plants, there were weeds that were growing and flourishing in that soil and grew up and choked it. Now, James says exactly the same thing can happen in our lives. And he says, therefore, if we are going to find the Word of God taking us on in our Christian experience, we need to be radical with sin as we allow the Word of God to be planted into our lives, we cannot at the same time allow, <coughs> allow sin to grow unchecked in our lives. And very simply, what he is speaking about is the need for continuous repentance. 
for the continuous examination of the life of the child of God and the continuous dealing with sin which alone enables the Word of God to flourish. Now that's an immensely important thing. As we come to read the Word of God, we need to prepare for it in this way. And to ask ourselves the question, day by day, am I ready to let God have exclusive rights to this ground into which He is going to plant His Word? Or am I seeking to grow several crops in the same soil? This is a very important question. James says, get rid of all moral filth and the evil that is so prevalent and humbly accept the word planted in you which can save you. So put it away, he says. Now that may be a very relevant thing for many of us here in church this evening. God constitutes us as the Old Testament puts it, the keeper of our own vineyard. And we need to recognize one of the fundamental principles of growth and planting and the development and fruit-bearing of which the Bible speaks in relation to the growth of Christian character. And that is that the soil needs to be rid of everything that would choke the growth of the Word. And that is the continuous place of repentance in the Christian life. It's a daily necessity. So our relationship with the Word of Truth is that we are to hear it eagerly, we are to prepare for it thoroughly. And then the third thing at the end of verse 21, we are to accept it or receive it humbly and wholeheartedly. Notice the phrase he uses, humbly accept the word planted in you which can save you. Now, what that means, very simply, is not that we try to affect some spirit of humility which is foreign to us and artificial and so on. What it simply means is that before I come to the Word of God, in the simplest manner, I am to bow my will, bow my neck, as it were, to receive the yoke of Christ before I hear what He says. That's the humble receiving of the Word of God of which James speaks. It means that before I come to listen to it, I am to bow before Him and say, Lord, I submit my life, my will, my mind and intellect, my emotions and every part of me to everything that You are going to say to me in Your Word. Now, that's a distinctive attitude which we apply nowhere else. You know how somebody may come and say to you, will you do something for me? And if you've got any sense, you will never say, yes, whatever it is, I shall. You will say, it depends what it is. And that's how we respond to that kind of request. Will you do something for me? Well, it entirely depends what it is, and it depends who he or she is as well, doesn't it? But when God comes to us in His Word, wherever we are reading it, whether it's at home in the morning or evening privately, or here publicly or wherever, or whether we are meeting with some friends around the Word of God, the vital thing is that when God says to us, now I am about to speak to you, you do not say, well then, Lord, I will obey you depending entirely on what it is and what you're going to say. And once I've thought about it, I'll give you some response. 
accepting the word humbly means not that I affect some demeanor, but that I bow my will to obey whatever God is going to say to me. And then the Word of God will do its work in me. That means, of course, that I have to be ready for God to reshape my thinking about all sorts of things. It means that I need to allow God to remold my whole lifestyle if that is what He is speaking to me about. But I need to Accept it humbly. And that humility is tested not, as I say, in some kind of affected mannerism. It is tested in my willingness to do precisely what God is going to say. But you notice the other word that is here, humbly accept. I'm not sure if accept is really the best translation of this word because it's a word that's often used in New Testament Greek for hospitality, giving hospitality to someone. And the acceptance of the Word of God is not the kind of reluctance that we sometimes inject into the word accept, don't we? It may be the will of God, so I'll just have to accept it, we say. I hear people constantly say that, well... It's a very desperate situation, but it may be the will of God, and I'll have to accept it. And we have a measure of reluctance into the Word. But in the original, the Word means the kind of thing that happens when somebody discovers someone who is entering their home, and they are people given to hospitality, and they embrace them, and they say, Welcome! It is delightful to have you here. Now, that's the attitude to the Word of God that James tells us we need to have. And the reason, of course, is that there is nothing that is designed to save us and bless us like the Word of God. We dare not, therefore, have a reluctance to bow ourselves before what He says. We have this welcome, joyful attitude to the Word of God if we really understand what it is. And we wholeheartedly accept it. We have to hear the Word eagerly, prepare for it thoroughly, and receive it humbly and wholeheartedly. It's a marvelous thing when you find God creating that wholehearted obedience to his word that I saw the other day when I was speaking to a young Christian man and the joy that there was in his life in discovering that the will of God was perfect even when it was mysterious. But here's the fourth thing. We must obey it perseveringly. Now, that's the theme of verses 22 to 25, which just at the right point bring in this little illustration that James uses. Do not merely listen to the Word and so deceive yourselves, is the introduction in verse 22. Now, of course, he has already said to us, my dear brothers, take note of this. Everyone should be quick to listen. So we need to be listeners. We need to be hearers of the Word of God. Our primary task is to be taught God's Word by Him. And that's true of everybody. But, he says, do not merely listen to the Word. Listeners, but not listeners only. Now, let me say to you that this is one of the great temptations, if I may apply the Word of God to myself, First of all, this is one of the great temptations of those who are called to be teachers and ministers of the Word of God. The easiest thing in the world is to listen to it, to hear it, to grasp it, to study it, to be thrilled by it even, and yet to imagine 
that learning and understanding and listening to the Word of God is the same thing as obeying it. And there's a peculiar snare in this. Those of you who teach Bible classes or preach or whatever, this is a peculiar snare that you can imagine that learning the Word of God and agreeing with it is the same thing as obeying it. So, says James, do what it says, the end of verse 22. And then he gives us this illustration from verse 23 about the man who goes and looks at himself in the mirror. Anyone who listens to the Word but does not do what it says is like a man who looks at his face in a mirror and after looking at himself goes away and immediately forgets what he looks like. Now, many of you might feel that uh, if I look in the mirror, for example... I might be thankful to God for a bad memory once I had gone away from the mirror. And the man has looked in the mirror and then has forgotten what he saw when he was looking into the mirror. Uh, It's a thing that may be common for many. Uh, There is another man, however, he says, who looks intently into the perfect law of God, that is, the Bible, the law that gives freedom. And he continues to do this, that is, he perseveres in gazing into it, not forgetting what he has heard, but doing it, and he will be blessed in what he does. Now, I do think there are two differences between these two figures. On the one hand, one man looks into the mirror, and he sees what is there and then goes away, And the other man gazes into the mirror, continues doing it. Do you notice? He says he looks intently and he continues to do this. So it is not a glancing, but a gazing. And it seems to me there is a distinction there. But the main distinction is between what happens afterwards in the two cases. In the first case, the man goes away and forgets what he has seen. In the second case, the man does not forget what he has heard or seen, but he goes on and obeys what has come to him from the mirror. Now, that principle is one that is of enormous importance. You'll notice that these are not alternatives. Uh, it is not an alternative for someone to say, well, of course, I don't find it very easy to continue looking into the perfect law. Uh, I'm a more practical Christian and don't have a great deal of time for all this listening to the Bible and having Bible study and so on. What the apostle is saying is your spiritual future depends on gazing intently into the perfect law that gives freedom and continuing to do it, not forgetting it, but doing it. And this is the man or woman who will be blessed. So the real distinction is the distinction between somebody who reads the Word of God and forgets it and somebody who reads the Word of God and obeys it. Now, the forgetting is not just a case of a bad memory. The forgetting is forgetting to put it into practice. That's the point. And there is nothing so important, I say, as this. I knew a man once who was... uh, a businessman, very successful, and also a preacher. And I remember him illustrating the very thing that James is here speaking about when he described the possibility. He said, think of this. Think of what might have happened when I went to Europe. He worked in the United States. And I 
was there for some considerable time and had to be away from my business in America. I had set everything up and from there I wrote to my staff twice every week. And I gave them the most detailed instructions. I wrote to them about new things that they couldn't have known and about different things that they had to do and change the structure of things in the firm. I wrote to encourage them and to tell them that they had to keep on doing certain things that they had already done. And then after many months, he said, I go back to the United States. And in the first morning that I'm there, I go up the stairs and open the door into the suite of offices. And I find the place in total chaos. I see the graph on the wall. Business has slumped disastrously. People don't seem to know what they should be doing. And everything is in a fearful mess. And I said to them, what's happened? Oh, they said, we're so glad to see you, sir. But what's happened? I said to them, didn't you get my letters? Regularly, sir, they said, twice every week. Didn't you read them? Yes, read them many times over, in fact, they said. As a matter of fact, the office manager said, we had a letter study session every morning. And we got together and we admired the way you wrote. We loved the things that you said. And we all said, what a master we have. As a matter of fact, he said, we even broke up into small groups so that we could discuss whether we had exactly got it right, what you had written to us. And uh, we had some marvelous times, he said. He said, do you ever do anything that I said? Do it, they said. Oh, no, we never thought about that. And he said to the number of us who had gathered, who were all laughing a bit by that time, you know you're really laughing at yourself because this is exactly what you do with the Bible. And I think he may well have been nearly right. Says James, anyone who listens to the word but does not do what it says is deceiving himself. Now, the last thing of all that he says is that we are not only to hear it eagerly, prepare for it thoroughly, receive it humbly and wholeheartedly, and obey it perseveringly, we are to exhibit it practically. Let me just point out to you what James speaks about as he spells out in detail three practical areas where our obedience to the word of truth will be exhibited. It's what he calls religion, and religion simply means the manner of our life, a credible practice in our daily life of the faith that we profess. Now, you will notice that this is not a definition of saving faith. It's a definition of a credible Christian life, and it concentrates on three things. A controlled tongue is the first one. Verse 26, if anyone considers himself religious and yet does not keep a tight rein in his tongue, he deceives himself and his religion is worthless. Got hold of that? In the second place, a compassionate heart. Verse 27, religion that God our Father accepts as pure and faultless is this to look after orphans and widows in their distress. And the third thing is a distinctive life. 
to keep oneself from being polluted by the world. Now, that's the mark that God is looking for in a life that has a credible profession. There are many other areas that the Bible emphasizes to us that are indexes of where we are spiritually, but here are three of them. A controlled tongue, a compassionate heart, a distinctive life. But the vital thing of all is the question that Jesus put to his disciples. You call me Lord, Lord, he says. Why do you not do the things that I say? Let's pray together. Father, we long for the kind of life that will be utterly obedient to everything that you say to us in your word. And we thank you that you have not left us to ourselves in this, but your Holy Spirit within us, who is the Spirit of truth, loves the Word of God and longs to strengthen and equip and enable us that we might obey it. We acknowledge before you that often the battles of our lives are battles between the flesh and the spirit because we so often want our own way, which is the way of disobedience. We pray that the Spirit of God in us may lead us to obey him more and more. For Jesus' sake we pray. Amen.